Thanks. All right. Well, uh, we'll kind of lead off the show. And I think it's appropriate that we start off with the SI joint first, just because uh, everything, it's like one of those disease entities that people don't recognize. And you can spend the rest of the course kind of saying, did that patient actually have SI joint disease? So, and as I was showing my, uh, my team back home, my talk like that, like, who's Noonan? And so I aged myself. <laughs> Does anybody know, like, Danny Noonan was in Caddyshack. Yes, Caddyshack. Like, Noonan, Noonan. So you just don't miss it, because you'll be looking right at it. And then the spoiler alert, he actually makes the uh, putt. But, uh, but this is what actually is tied. You might know this one better. Is the eye only sees the mind knows. And if you're not thinking about SI joint disease, you'll be looking at it. And you'll be giving patients unnecessary you know, interventions and surgeries, all because they have SI joint disease and you didn't recognize it. So, just a bias uh, uh, here, I, I have uh, been very involved with SI, the SI joint for years and have helped design a system for primarily revisions initially, but now just a great all around primary system. So we'll kind of talk about the anatomy, um, diagnosis, um, strategies to find out what it is and then how do you treat it. Um, and then a little plug, I'm also on the board of this organization, SIMEG, which is this international group about SI joint education. So. Uh, we have a meeting in a, uh, next month in Austria, and the next year it's in Japan. So if you're interested in the SI joint and like you know talk about the SI joint, it's a great organization. Um, so my journey started a long time ago um, at, at the University of Minnesota with some trauma um, mentors with Dr. Sinkowski, Dr. Paul, as you guys may see up there, and Dr. Stark, all just kind of pioneers in the SI joint field. And then I uh, joined Mayo and then gave a talk in 2011 on pelvic ring injuries. And that's where it started, because everybody's like, oh, wow, you know a little bit about the pelvis and the pelvic ring and the SI joint and sacrum. So that's kind of where it started. And then in 2015, I actually kind of started this SI joint clinic. And now it's just like completely blown up where uh, we're getting a lot of patients come in for just don't know what's going on, get the diagnosis, primary diagnosis. And then we're seeing a lot more of these revisions for different types of implants and allografts and so on, which we can talk about later. But I don't know if you guys know this, but the sacrum is actually a, a Latin for sacred. It's in the middle of the, uh, of the body. Some thoughts are that when they used to burn bodies, the only bone left was the sacrum. And so that's why they thought it was kind of this holy bone. Or it might be in the front uh, or where the, uh, the, the organs are for um, generative uh, stuff and then uh, I googled. <laughs> I don't get too too crazy there. But I actually put this in AI. You'll see a couple AI generated images in there. So I said, put the uh, sacrum at the center of the universe, and that's what it came up with. So the SI joint disease is there. If you look at what people complain about to their doctors, musculoskeletal health is everywhere. Right? That's the most primary complaint that patients are seeing their physicians for. And of that, it's the back. That's the biggest issue that people are seeing their their uh, their, their their providers for. So, it's we're in a, we're in a good we're in a good profession right here. With SI joint disease, however, people don't know where where it goes. How do you diagnose it? Where's the true pain generator coming from? And there's there are some algorithms out there, but nothing's really been generally accepted. And this leads us to give unnecessary decompressions, unnecessary fusions, unnecessary hip scopes, unnecessary this and that. When all along, it's just the SI joint that needs to be appropriately treated. So this is a we, this is a pretty oft quoted uh, article from one of my you know, mentors, Dr. Polly. But you know the SI joint, people think it's hip, people think it's back, and there's a huge crossover of the SI joint with all of this. So just really keeping the, aware of the SI joint is going to is really going to save you. And just because he had a spine fusion, you can't rule it out because we know that this the the presence of that spine fusion can cause SI joint pain to be directly attributed to it. It's all it's all simple physics and force transfer. You take away motion up above, it's going somewhere, and uh, it doesn't disappear. So it goes right to the SI joint, and they can really really uh, cause it to have excess motion, which is theoretically why it's why it's occurring. So. Always keep in mind that it's there. That's my favorite quote for all my residents, is the eye only sees what the mind knows. And just be aware that it's there. Um, the SI joint is, is a joint. It moves. It's not like a knee or a hip, but it is uh, does have um, synovial uh, fluid in it. It has hyaluronized cartilage, but an extremely complex ligament to support. Uh, and there are a lot of variations of how the sacrum and the iliosacral joint is formed. You can see on the right front here, there's only about the front one third to a half is actually cartilage. Posteriorly, it's all uh, fibrocartilaginous uh, matrix back there. Um, and the SI joint motion on the right, if you look at the intact SI joint and you look at gap and rotation, it barely moves. And, uh, and when you force this ultra congruent joint to move, that's theoretically where, it's, where the pain's coming from, both from inside the joint and likely some ligamentous irritation in the back. In the back, you have an extremely stout ligamentous complex. 
um, very, very strong. And you know, coming from trauma, you know, we look at this iliolumbar ligament up there as a marker of instability. With trauma, you'll see a ripped off or a valse TP that can be representative of some uh, increased motion there, and then the anterior SI joint ligaments. And so when I do open SI joint fusions, that is stout. And you have to take your bovi and, and bovi all that off, get into the SI joint and decorticate it that way. Um, Dysmorphism is common, and I think if you take anything home from this talk, it's recognizing a dysmorphic sacrum, because this is how you will not injure L5, which is the most oft one that's, that's injured if you don't recognize this. Um, so this is the, uh, what I would call a normal one on the left and a dysmorphic one on the right. And uh, in trauma, we kind of just, we don't count down to find out if it's lumbarized or sacralized. We just say upper sacral, sacral segment and lower sacral segment, and so the dysmorph is you know, common, almost a half of patients have some element of dysmorphism, but you get the outlet radiograph, these are all the factors that show that this patient does not have a normal sacrum. And you need to recognize these because this is going to dictate where your implant's going to go so you don't hurt something, okay? So we'll go through each of these, each of these five uh, things there. Um, and you can also see it on CT, and so we're looking specifically on the CT of that uh, iliac cortical density. Uh, which is this line, you know, right here, which represents the, the, the thick part of the ilium going right across here, and that's kind of all five, and I'll show that in a second. So this is the lateral view. The bottom right, we're lining up our greater sciatic notches, and I checked the lateral view right when the pin goes about right there to, to go into the body of one. And you want to be, uh, you can extrapolate where you are to make sure you're not coming out the front where you're going to bag five. And again, this represents what the ICD really means. That's the density right there. That's where L5 rests. So if you're anterior to that line, uh, you're going to see some foot twitching as the pin goes across there. So be very, very careful. So what, where's the dysmorph? So that's where the, uh, the disc base is at the top of the iliac crests. You have these residual mammillary bodies on the top of that upper sacral segment. You have these bizarrely misshapen neural foramen that's coming out at you, and I'll just call it S1 um, at that, but it's probably L5, but we didn't, we're not counting down. Residual disc space that you can see there, and then these really acute alar dents. So as you remember, you know, from, that, from, the, from the last couple slides there, that's where L5 is sitting right there. And if you just put your implant willy-nilly right across here, and I've seen it before, that's where L5 sits, and you're going to hit L5. So just really recognize where that anatomy is. So everything, I mean, you just name it, and it can cause SI joint disease. And so that's why it can be somewhat elusive is because, uh, you know, the, you may think it's something else, but it, it can be SI joint disease for any number of uh, things. In my practice, these are kind of the top factors, and I'm really interested in number five because I think this is kind of where, where we're maybe missing the boat in some patients, and I think there's some research in this colonial nerve, and so we're starting to really investigate this more uh, at Mayo Clinic as a, as a cause of untreated back pain. And so um, this is just some research I've been doing on it lately, and it, overseas, and especially Japan, it's, they, it's like a colonial nerve epidemic over there. And so there's a lot of literature about that uh, overseas. Every patient in my clinic gets these standard studies for SI joint evaluation. This should be part of every single patient you come in should get these particular studies, and they should get flamingo views. Because you may be looking at that image on the right, and it's just a normal AP pelvis standing here, but then you have them do these single leg stance views, so-called flamingo views, and they have this level of instability. So you won't know this unless you look for it and get these kind of single leg stance views. So. The other thing is that we're, we, we're all super hyper-focused on CTs and MRIs, and it's critical for us to really evaluate those, but the presence of SI joint arthritis doesn't really mean anything because after the age of like 50, everybody has it, and these are asymptomatic people. And so you can't just look at an x-ray and say, you have SI joint disease, let's go to surgery or get an injection because it might be completely asymptomatic. The most important part of the SI joint diagnosis is the exam. And so many patients that come and see me, they've never been touched before like we examine them. So really kind of listen to their history and do their exam. This looks like a radiculopathy, but it's not. This is SI joint radiating pain that is extremely common in this very predictable pattern. And so they'll, you'll be fooled that there's some other radicular pattern, but it's not. The SI joint, when they come in there, they'll be offloading typically the painful side if it's unilateral, and that's extremely common. I do all these. These are all the provocative tests that have been listed. The highlighted ones are kind of my favorites, but these, you can 
pick your exam maneuver, and maybe it, that's yours, but it's a culmination of everything kind of put together on what makes the SI joint diagnosis. And none of them are perfect. They've all been studied. None of them have perfect sensitivity and specificity, and so it's really critical. This is what I do. Um, I kind of start, you know, looking for seating imbalance. Then I do a standing exam where I kind of turn around, poke them around a little bit, and I do a big supine examination, um, listing all those uh, tests there. And then this is my new favorite test, and I just, I just am going to publish a video about how to do this test. But this is amazing. And my favorite by far test now, because what it does is it, it compresses the SI joint and they'll get up off the table. And a lot of times, they're, if they truly have instability, their pain goes away completely. The radicular pain goes away. So um, if we have time, maybe during lunch, we can show that video, because I just haven't published it yet. This is uh, the, the exam. So if you get an opportunity, this is, uh, we just published this a little bit ago. But this, if you look at this, it shows exactly how you should, I, how you should examine the SI joint. So that whole. Um, list of studies there, I just show exactly how we do that on patients. So kind of handy. All right, that video's coming. The other one, the last, the criteria four, when I diagnose SI joint disease, positive history, positive exam, imaging, positive, and injection seals the deal. But that's the most technically challenging part of, of kind of this um, uh, diagnosis. And so if you don't have a perfect injection and you're getting this, I mean, who the heck can make any treatment decisions off an injection like that, because they anesthetize the whole quadrant. So you don't know. So it has to be a perfectly done injection where you can see that injectate go in the SI joint, and there's not this kind of what I call an amorphous blob of, of contrast down there, because otherwise who, who, you can't make a decision off that. So really critical to have a good, in, good injection. And one reason I get a CT on everybody is because if they're using fluoro, they're just going chink, chink, chink up against that posterior osteophyte. They're not getting in the SI joint. They're just anesthetizing the local area in the, in the, in the ligament. So you really have to um, you know, talk with the radiology team and know they can get a CT guided if they need to. And this is mandatory, that they have to give you a pre and post injection score documented somewhere, because sometimes patients won't remember it. And so our radiologists are kind of you know, have this kind of protocol um, to do that. Or I have my PA call them like the next morning and I say, you know, how, how, did, it, how did it go for you? And then have my PA document this um, in the chart. And that way you have record because they'll come back six weeks later and they're like, oh, it didn't work. Well, it worked for an hour. That's all we care about, you know? So it's, uh, the steroid is kind of for them. If something else is going on, um, I usually try to address that first. I think kind of the most common would be hip pathology. And so I'll get an intraarticular hip injection because I think there's a huge interplay between that, that stiff hip and that whole hemipelvis rotating back and forth. And so sometimes if you just give them a, um, an injection, you can solve their SI joint pain just by kind of greasing up that hip a bit. Sometimes it's facet issues up above. Um, so if it's, all, if it's the hip, I'll give them hip replacement first. If it's the if it's the if it's the back, usually the SI joints first because you talk what's easier, like a long multi-segment fusion or an SI is probably the SI. So, hip issues, it definitely works. This patient had concomitant hip and SI. I injected them both. We gave them her hip. Uh, we gave her hip replacement, and you can see these promise scores have that crossover sign. Is what you're going for with outcome studies, and we solved her SI joint pain simply by giving her a hip replacement. Um, this patient had just profound facet issues, and so probably force transfer. This is kind of a hard deal. Do you go ahead and fuse her back with, you know, or because she failed ablations, um, and we give her SI joints, and it, they're getting better. She's still kind of um, struggling a little bit. Who gets surgery? You know, it's uh, those four criteria on the right have to be met when all non-operative factors have been um, have been exhausted and documented. They've been exhausted. Um, these are all the non-operative methods, but fusion does work, and it works well. This is kind of just Mayo Clinic data. You know, we can see mean ODI, you know, is, is over 20 um, at that 12-year follow-up, and uh, the pain scores, you know, plummet um, reliably, and then the same scores, which is this single alpha, alpha uh, numeric score for success, you know, is above 90%, and so it really works well. Um, let's see. So. Technique, there's a lot of techniques. I template every single case exactly like this. There are hundreds and hundreds of these in our PAC system, but that's, I template every single case to make sure I don't hit L5 or S1, um, and I can know, you know how much I'm going to decorticate and, and so on. 
This is where you want to put your screws and your lateral. You want to be kind of low in anterior or kind of middle because if you're low in posterior, you're going to hit S1 and they're going to get a radiculopathy. If you're high or you're good in cranial posterior, you're, you're going to be pretty safe. And then cranial and anterior is a little bit less used. But I kind of like that icon of the hog screw right dead center in the middle, as you can see with those templates. I do it in the prone position. I draw that grid out, PSI, S long axis, the femur, draw a line down, divide it in thirds. And again, this is all just uh, online if you want to watch how we do this. But this is called the uh, uh, inlet view, where I do anterior and posterior ad adjustments. And I'll show you this on, on TV in the lab here in about an hour. Um, and then um, that's over line one on two. Here's the outlet view, you know, upon putting the symphysis over S2. And that's where we do cranial caudal. Uh, adjustments, and then I always check a lateral view if the anatomy is kind of goofy to make sure I'm not anterior to that ICD. So you can see we're right in the middle of that safe zone. L5 is safe on this one. So that's the surgical technique up above um, there. So that'll be online if you want to take a look at that. I like I like doing it percutaneous. I do I do uh, have done a whole host of opens in there, but that is that's morbid and it's aggressive, and it's about three or four day hospital stay. Um, I like to get a true fusion, just like we fuse ankles and elbows and whatever, whatever else, by just using these, these principles. I like, to, I like to scrape out all the arthritis and bone graft it, squeeze it together, and lock it together to really get that true fusion, which I think you know, really minimizes chances of failure down the road. Second, I think this, the way that I do it, really can address failures. And so all these have a fundamental problem of loosening the sacral ala, where it's butter bone. If you guys do any fixation in there, it's, you can just push your finger through the ala. It's that porous, and the Hounsfield units are that poor. And so we, oh, this, <laughs> if you guys ever see allografts, I see a lot of these allografts, and so they're, uh, that's, another, uh, that's another deal all by itself. But um, they're easy to fix because you just blaze right through them because it's just dead bone. Uh, two critical steps, put that pin where it needs to go, and then decorticate and rip out all the SI joint inside there. And then you can get compression, and that gives you stability. So you can see it's really kind of compressing that whole SI joint area. And I think that's why this tongue and groove concept really hits home with stability. And, uh, and uh, that's why they get immediate pain relief. Post-op, what I do for all of my SI joint fusions, on unilaterals, there's weight bearing is tolerated using crutches for comfort just to offload that kind of painful uh, side just from the surgery itself. And then I see them routinely for imaging all the way up to two years. And then I follow outcomes in every single patient. They all get promised cats, physical function and pain, and they all get ODIs and insane score at every single follow-up. And we're just getting ready to publish our two and three-year data um, on a recent set. So um, to, to kind of close it down, you just look for it. Hopefully give you some, some tips on how to identify SI joint fusion or SI joint pathology. Remember, always keep it in your differential, because it's there, and you'll miss it if you're not thinking about it. Um, don't operate first, the first time you see them. Give them all sorts of non-op. Um, surgery works, there's a lot of methods out there. Um, I just like following the principles of any fusion surgery because I think it's pretty darn reliable. So um, with that, I think I'll probably uh, close and then uh, just later on for, for your table instructors or uh, anybody else, these are just some hot topics I think that might be good to address. All right, Thanks very much. Right, whirlwind, thank you. For Dr. Cross, before we move on to the uh, lab demonstration, you know, one, one of the things that that I find interesting, like you said, is the clunial nerve. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, sometimes the clunial nerve sort of traverses the ligaments that cross the SI joint, mm -hmm. and. I think that sometimes you get successful treatment of clunial nerve injuries by fusing the joint because yes. of the stability. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a catch-22 situation, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. One of the treatments they do are just are simple decompressions of the of the clunial nerve as it goes through the fascia between the PIIS and the PSIS. And I think there's that micromotion of the SI joint, which is probably pinching that nerve as it's yeah. going through the fascia. And so one of the treatments is a decompression of that or, or a resection. And I'm not sure which one's best, but uh, hopefully we'll figure that out. I think it's a real, I think it's a real diagnosis for sure. What, do you know what ends up being, what, what's the side effect of the resection of the clunial nerve? Like it, numbness of the it's, buttocks? It's a, it's a fair amount of, I, so it, that's, to extrapolate from that, I usually cut the LFCN when I do lateral windows for pelvis surgery and they get a numb patch in their thigh. That's yeah. the same thing that's gonna happen on their, on, their, on their backside. So a little bit of a trade-off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, great, all right, thank you. Cool. So, uh
guys. We're gonna